Hi there, and thank you for joining us on the Overcomers Overcoming podcast. We feature those who are in the process of overcoming or have overcome any type of life encounter, life obstacle that at the time seemed to be almost insurmountable. With this podcast, we have three objectives in mind. Our first objective is we want you to know with a confident resolve, you are not alone. We want to work with you. We want you to know there are others who are working with you, who want to help you through whatever you are encountering. And together, we will get through whatever you're experiencing. Our second objective is there are multiple options for any life encounter you are facing. We want to help you develop a resolve that there are various options and solutions to any life dilemma. Our third objective is to help you with critical thinking skills. If you're encountering something that was possibly a decision you made sometime in the past, and if you had the opportunity for a life redo, you would make a different decision. We want to help you with those critical thinking skills that can help you make an informed decision and not encounter what you're going through at the moment. We are the Cooper Culture, a veteran-owned business. We work with business personnel and families to develop and sustain connected relationship cultures within their families and organizations. That type organization is one where people feel wanted, appreciated, and genuinely a part of that organization. I'm with my wife and business partner, Marty, who has helped me facilitate this podcast. Today we feature Beth Gustin, who was born premature, but more importantly, was born blind as a result of the premature birth. She has learned, in spite of her blindness, to adjust to life, to adjust to the various things she's having to do to cope with her situation. She has learned to never say, I can't, to say no, but rather to persist and get things done, to accomplish those things she purposes to do. One of the amazing things she's done is to ski in spite of being blind. That to me was something that I could hardly imagine. But Marty, what are some takeaways our listeners can gain from Beth's life testimony? Ron, you can hear Beth's resilience to go forward and never give up. She learned that early in life and has been very successful helping others through life situations where they are disabled in some way. Beth has started her own business. She's helping others overcome grief to make it through various life challenges. She has a great story. Let's listen and learn together. Beth, it is great to have you with us. Our listeners can't know this just by listening, but you were born blind. You have adapted to that throughout life Our listeners are going to be very interested in knowing just how you've adapted your blindness throughout life, how you have dealt with that. You are a successful business owner. Beth, there's a lot of you who our listeners want to learn about, know about. There are listeners who are not blind, but they're just uncertain of who they are Our listeners can learn a lot from you. But Beth, it's great to have you with us. I am really glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us just very briefly, you were born blind. Is this a genetic defect or how did this come about? I was born at 25 and a half weeks gestation, so about three and a half months premature. Over 40 years ago, the chances of survival were next to nothing. It was about a 2% chance I'd be born alive and 10% chance I would survive if I was. And so I am really grateful to be here. But due to the complications of being born premature, given too much oxygen, the bright lights of the incubators, the premature birth, all of that combined together to create a perfect storm of total blindness. Well, 
to some extent, you're a miracle talking to us right now. And I'm not trying to patronize or in any way marginalize your situation. That's how I'm processing what you just said. I was called that when I was first born, from what I've been told. Wow, that's just great. Beth, you didn't have to adjust per se, meaning it's not like you were living with sight for a period of time and then had to adjust. But our listeners, most of our listeners are not able to identify with blindness. You're able to, I'm guessing, and I, I really want for you to tell us, through your senses, you're able to very possibly, I'm guessing, discern a lot of things that even those of us with sight are not able to discern as well as you. But Beth, we're very interested in learning just whatever you may want to express about how you're able to adjust to different things. Are you able, so just as an example, are you able to walk around the house, walk on the street by yourself, or do you need assistance? Those are the kind of things a lot of our listeners are not really aware of. Sure. So I will first say, you know, it takes a village and absolutely I can walk around my house on my own. I can walk down the street by myself. I get places on my own. Um, before I had a service dog, I used the white cane that most people are probably familiar with. But I began you know, learning all of those skills as soon as any sighted child would learn to navigate their world. And I really credit my parents and teachers and all the support that I had from day one. I went to two different preschools, one with all my sighted peers, and then one that was designed to help individuals with visual impairment uh, gain the skills they would need to compete with their sighted peers. And then my mom and dad learned Braille, and I had a teacher, two teachers growing up from kindergarten through 12th grade that, that would either teach me the skills to be independent in the world or to help make sure that all my assignments were in a format that I could you know, complete them in. And again, just to make sure I had all the skills to be equal to my sighted peers. I was the only blind student growing up in my school district, uh, grades kindergarten through 12th. I want to build toward your business, how you're able to do all of that. But I'm curious, did you have to endure maybe people who just don't understand blindness? And I'm, what I'm trying to build up to, Beth, is did you experience some kind of, if not bullying people, just making awkward expressions, that kind of thing. I hope I'm not asking a question that's inappropriate. No, not at all. And I, and yes, I think to to an extent, I did experience some of that. I think one thing that helped offset some of that in my experience is every August, September, when the school year began, I would present to my class I'm like, hey, this is who I am. I am blind. Here's what that means. Here's how I do things. You know, if you see me doing something differently than you, but still accomplishing it, that's my way of, of getting it done. And so I really tried to normalize and increase the comfort level around my blindness. So it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it's just one small aspect of who I am. Yes, it's definitely shaped who I am and my experiences in life, but it's a really minor part of who I am as a whole. And I've tried hard over the years to express that and put that out there. As we see you on the street, and you're talking to us from Denver, Colorado, if we were beside each other on the street, would you welcome us helping you across the street? Or would you say, hey, I know where traffic is. I know what's happening. Thank you. But my senses are such that I can see even without my eyes. It depends on the situation. I am happy for someone to come up to me and ask if I need help. But if I say no, I need the person to respect that. Um, you know, I have a lot of tools, including my guide dog, and we are trained to work together to you know, navigate traffic and things like that. I don't hear better than anybody else, but I am much more aware of what all of my other senses tell me because that's how I interpret the world. So I'm more aware, but not better than. All right. So your guide dog is one that helps you mostly across the street. And I would certainly hope that all of us would respect you enough that, you know, we offer, but if you, your guide dog are, are good enough, then yep, 
uh, you're just one of us. I would certainly hope that to be the case. And in most cases it is. And yes, the, the guide dog's job is to make sure that we get places safely. But it's my job to tell, in this case, him how to get there. So I'm the one that has to read the traffic and I'm the one that has to know where I'm going and which directions I want to take to get there, you know, left or right or wherever I happen to be. But it's his job to make sure that I avoid obstacles, um, that I don't fall down a curb or stairs, because they're trained to tell us about all those things in our environment. Wow. Now you've really generated my curiosity. You can't see the store. So how do you know where it is, the lefts, the rights, and so forth? Is that all through Braille? And I apologize, Beth, I'm very ignorant. We don't learn unless we ask questions. And I know that the number of individuals with total blindness, uh, especially from birth, I don't remember the exact statistics, but there's not a lot of us in the world. So I appreciate the questions. And I think one reason why I enjoy being on podcasts is to educate people. We can blame yeah. that both my parents were teachers on that one, but uh, <laughs> kind of grew up being in my blood. But um, to answer your question, we don't always know where we're going, <laughs> um, but we we try to have a general idea. So one thing I will do, and GPS has really helped in this regard. I love the advancements of technology. I mean, my iPhone does a lot for me as far as I can you know, look at a street preview and kind of figure out where things are. But you know, back in the day, we didn't have all the technology. And so we would often call the store and say, hey, I am totally blind. I'm coming to visit your establishment. Can you please let me know what are some landmarks near you? What is your exact address if I don't have that? Because there's some tips and tricks we can use to kind of figure out what side of the street that's going to be on. And we can ask what other stores are around this particular store. So we can use our other senses to narrow it down. And if we get it wrong, we just walk in and walk back out and try the next one. Beth, I want to ask, and I hope this doesn't sound like a a dumb question. How do you talk to your dog so the dog understands what you're trying to get across to them? And I don't know how else to ask it because I'm sure these dogs are very smart. He actually speaks Swedish and I'm just kidding. I have an odd sense of humor. Um, <laughs> We always, well, so I went to Guide Dogs for the Blind, and they're located in Oregon and California, and every school is a little bit different in their training methods and the commands they use and, and things like that. We always say their name first, and then we just tell them, you know, Manolo left, Manolo right, Manolo find the door, Manolo find the curb, and they know those words because they've gone through extensive training before we are matched with them. Like I said, we have to know when to make that left turn. We have to know approximately roughly where that door is so that we are hopefully, you know, in the right direction to to find it. So if there wasn't a door there, would they guide you to a door? <laughs> I'm just um if they could see one, yes. If they can't see it, they just kind of like in my case, he'll just kind of pause and I don't know what his facial expression like, Mom, what what do you want? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what he's looking at me with his expression, but they kind of have their ways of communicating, like, hey, I'm confused. I can't carry out what you're asking me to do. Mm -hmm. Beth, you mentioned it took some amount of time for you to, and I'm not sure I'm going to express this correctly, adjust to, accept yourself, whatever the term is. And I'm, I'm saying that to ask you how you would express yourself. But it is a matter of adjusting to the environment, adjusting to everything, it seems. Can you help put that in a better perspective for me? Sure. So I believe that all of us are adjusting every day to something, honestly. And I think when we have a disability or something that impacts how we navigate the world differently than the quote unquote average person, there is some adjustment involved there. And whether it's accepting yourself for who you are to be confident in the world, whether it's accepting, okay, I, I navigate the world differently and therefore I might look different or do things differently. It's it's all a matter of accepting whatever that is for us. And I'm a firm believer in being authentically yourself and don't be afraid to be who you are. Because if you think about it, we all navigate the world differently. We all do things a little differently from the next person. So it took me a bit to come to this acceptance, I guess you could call it. I kind of joke, it took me a little over 30 years to view my blindness as a gift and how I can use that to help others. And what I mean by that is part of my career path was 
teaching individuals who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s to adjust to losing their sight and teaching them the skills they would need to be able to continue living independently and with dignity. And I became a program manager for that program over time as well. But it's when I began that work that I truly began to recognize that my blindness could be used to help others. I mean, before that, my goal was to be a therapist. I always wanted to be a therapist. I knew that from a very early age, kind of deciding which type of therapist I wanted to be and ending up where I am now was a was a journey. But from the blindness side of things, that, that's a different acceptance process, if that makes sense. It does. Did you go through a journey of self-discovery, but it embedded in that term, I'm thinking, determining your strengths, who you are, maybe working through some personality vulnerabilities such as, I wish I weren't blind. Did anything of what I just said factor into your life? I think it did. I mean, I think about when I turned 16 or even 15, I could not get a driver's permit. I couldn't get a driver's license. And that was hard because all of my friends, because most of my friends are sighted, were getting their driver's license and experiencing that. And that's something that still is frustrating to me just as a, you know, because I can't hop in a car and go somewhere. And so things like that, I use the phrase kind of regrieve. We tend to regrieve a loss at different points in our life as we experience things that we fully can't enjoy. And a simple example of this is if you have lost a parent and you're getting married, you're going to regrieve that loss on your wedding day because your parent is supposed to be there. That's what we're raised to believe. The same is true with blindness. I think when there's experiences like a sunset or a sunrise, I still enjoy those things on a very different level, but I wish I could fully experience that from a sighted perspective. Were you 30 years or so before you, I'll use the term, reckoned with yourself, your situation, to the point where you thought, I am who I am, I have what I have. And I'm thinking, Beth, you probably exemplify what I use the term true grit, that is, I'm going to overcome. I will be who I am meant to be. I will determine my strengths, those kinds of things. Beth, I don't want to try to put words that are not there, but that's what I'm perceiving you are. I think I discovered that more in college and grad school. When you go to school to become a therapist, at least in my experience, you do a ton of self-reflection. And you do a ton of looking at how are you going to show up in the world and how do you want your clients to see you and you know what are you bringing into the therapy room? We do a lot of work around that on this journey of, of becoming a, a therapist. And so I did a lot of that reckoning, if you will, in my 20s, I think. And I think it happens all the way through life. I think as we're forming friendships, as we're, I was in marching band from sixth, seventh grade through high school, you know, when we do these experiences, I used to ski. All these different things, I think, help us become who we are and help us kind of explore how we are perceived by others and how we want to be perceived by others. Did you just say you ski? Do you mean snow ski? Yes. Oh. Yep. Downhills and cross country. That is amazing to me that you can do that. Could you just kind of walk us through how you're taught to do that? Sure. So in Winter Park, Colorado here, we have what is called, I'm going to get this name wrong, so I apologize. I believe it's the National Sports Center for the Disabled. That program offers a lot of different athletic experiences for individuals with disabilities. And so what they would do, and I haven't skied for years because I got a knee injury snowboarding, they would match you with a sighted skier. And that person would you know, kind of teach you how to ski and give you directions so that you could ski down the mountains and navigate the moguls and things like that. Amazing. I'm fascinated, Beth. I'm guessing you were on a ski slope without any trees. I mean, you you wouldn't know if a tree is out there until you hit it. I'm trying to think through this, through your senses, learn how to do all this. I mean, I've hit trees too, but not everyone's perfect and we get our directions backwards sometimes. But it takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of trust. It takes being aware of your surroundings and using all your senses. I've always been raised as have a lot of other individuals I know with, with vision loss to never let it stop you. And if you want to go be a runner, go do that. If you want to, you know, I can't think of other examples right now, but whatever you want to do, there's usually a way you can figure out to do it. 
I will tell you, Beth, that is a part of what I define as true grit. You, you may not use that term. Nothing will hold Beth back. And you're the epitome of that kind of persistence. Whatever I want to do, I'll determine how to go about it. Nothing is going to hold me back, says Beth. That's who I'm believing Beth is. Have I mischaracterized you at all? No, that's that's definitely who I am. And I I definitely did not get here alone. I credit my parents and my brother for you know raising me to have this belief that nothing's gonna stop me. I think I gave them a lot of gray hair over the years. <laughs> I took that to heart a little bit more than I think they thought I might have in some instances. But I also think it takes a village and I, you know, I would not be here today without the support of a lot of people. And I also hope I can give back and help other people become who they would like to be. If I'm interpreting you correctly, you had your heart and mind set on being a therapist, but you are something other than a therapist now. Am I hearing you correctly? So I'm I'm still a therapist. Uh, I knew I always wanted to be a therapist from about middle school. Just a lot of my personal experiences and opportunities I had throughout middle school, high school, college helped me further define that, yes, I want to be in a helping profession in some way. I originally was going to do music therapy, but chose not to go down that path for a lot of other reasons. And then I was looking at being a play therapist, but I was dissuaded from that because it'd be hard for me to see the kids' as drawings. I might knock over their sand tray figures and, you know, in that moment of time, I did not argue that. I think looking back, there would have definitely been some ways I could have made that work, but I am now a grief and loss therapist and I love what I do. Great. So you have a practice now or your, your therapy is in helping others overcome grief, loss, and the like. Is that, am I uh, summarizing your business correctly? You are. So I work with clients experiencing loss, uh, whether it's a human death loss. I specialize in pet loss grief, and I also help a lot of individuals continue to adjust to vision loss and navigate the grief that comes up with that. Is most of your business virtual or in person, or are you functioning in in any particular manner? I have a hybrid, so I offer in person or virtual. I prefer in person. But I love the fact that we can offer virtual sessions now because we can reach more people. For the person who is experiencing grief of some sort, is it a matter of having them talk their way through that to an extent? And Beth, I'm asking you a question. It could be much deeper, more expansive, and could be very personalized. I do understand that. But for the listener who's dealing with grief, how do they get over that person? Well, actually a widow comes to mind right now who 18 months ago experiences the death of her husband and she's still grieving over that. Is there a general process of how you deal with a person's grief? This is a very broad question. There's a number of different grief theories out there, but I believe we don't get over a loss. I believe we learn to move forward with a loss. In some respects, we wouldn't want to stop grieving because I believe grief is an expression of how deeply we have loved that person. And so what I help my clients with is finding a way to move forward and regain or, or find again their purpose as well as honoring their past and finding ways to stay connected to their loved one in a way that works for them. And then we also work on giving your grief a voice because oftentimes I think our grief needs to be seen and heard and witnessed. And whether that's through talking, whether it's through art, whether it's through music or exercise, you know, we all have to find our own path forward. For the person who may be a listener right now, who is experiencing a type grief that says, I just feel my world has stopped. The death of, and it could be any number of things, but my identity, my world, everything was built around, could be this animal, this person. I just feel as if my world has stopped. I don't have the motivation to go forward and so forth. Is there a process that we can help that person through. And there are many people, many of our listeners who would say, I don't even know how to begin with a person who's experiencing grief. The biggest thing is to help them see that there is hope. 
you know, I, I've heard this phrase, I don't remember where I heard it, but I tell my clients, I will hold hope for you until you can hold it yourself. Mm -hmm. I think it's just being with them. You don't have to say anything, but just sitting in silence can be helpful. Distracting people, you know, can you get them to go out to a movie? Can you get them to go out to lunch? Anything to kind of help take their mind off of it for a little bit is helpful. And just being here and saying, I'm here with you. I don't know what to say because no words can take away the pain, but I'm here and I will be here. We often feel very alone in our grief and feel like that a lot of our support system has gone with that loss because people often pull away because they don't know what to say. And so and, I think just being with that person. And you're right, Beth, there, there are a lot of our listeners who will almost avoid, it's not intentional, but because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings, we tend to avoid people who are going through different things because we don't know how to work, how to best work with that person. It may be a matter, and I think you're saying it, that sometimes just listen. I'm very interested in your thoughts, Beth, about the person who might function best momentarily by being alone. I tend to think there's a difference between I just need some alone time to think through as opposed to isolating myself. Isolation in this context, I'm asking Beth, is one where I'm just going to go off and in, into a, a, a at least a figurative closet type thing. How can you help our listeners differentiate it's good to, or it may be useful for a person to have a few hours, days alone, but not prolonged isolation. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that's helpful is I will encourage my clients, you know, can you schedule in what I call a grief break? So sometimes we want to schedule time for grief if we are pushing it aside and not acknowledging it, but the opposite can be true as well. Can we schedule a break from our grief? Can you do something for 15 minutes that even somewhat takes your mind off of that grief. I always encourage people helping those who are grieving, don't stop calling. They may not answer you right away. They may not call you back right away, but don't stop calling because they do appreciate that. And that does help with the isolation. It's okay to show up and bring a meal. It's okay to stop by. We as grievers may say, don't, we don't want anything, but ultimately those things can help. For the listener who would like to learn more about grief, how to work with people, let's say as a care taker, or the person who needs grief counseling, how can they contact you? So I'm only licensed to practice in Colorado at this point in time. So if you're wanting to work with me in Colorado, you can go to the website, which is transitioningthroughchange.com. You can send me an email, which is beth at transitioningthroughchange.com. If you don't live in the state of Colorado, Colorado and are needing some grief support, there's a lot of resources out there where you can find a therapist specializing in grief. A therapy Den is one. Psychology Today is another one. Um, there's lots of different directories out there where you can find a therapist based on your zip code, your insurance, if you're going to use your insurance, and the type of challenge you would like support with. To help our listeners understand, I want to make sure that I understand exactly the application of your licensed only in Colorado. If a person from outside of Colorado were to call you based on this podcast and just say, Beth, I really appreciate your gentle voice and everything about you. Would you be able to talk with that person, even though they're not in Colorado? Uh, I guess what I'm asking, Beth, is what's the difference between a casual conversation versus actual uh, therapy session? So the difference is, the long story short, we cannot practice therapy across state lines at the present moment. There's a lot of change happening with this. The difference is, I can give someone resources but I cannot get into their personal struggles and provide them coping skills and techniques one-on-one. -on -one. I can't do that one-on-one. -on -one. So right. I would give them resources basically to help them find someone outside my state that lives in their state. So if a person were to contact you as a result of this podcast, you would have to ask them if they live in Colorado before you could discuss details. Am I processing that correctly? Yes, you're correct. Just so our listeners are very aware of that, our listeners who would want to contact you, I would 
I'm going to give this recommendation and Beth, you tell me if you would prefer something different, but identify yourself in the state you live in just so that you know up front whether you're, well, the, the degree to which you can speak with them. That is extremely helpful because I don't end up wasting your time either if I'm thinking you're in Colorado. And so I've, you know, I've learned to ask, where do you live? And there is this is a little bit of the weeds here, but there is, so I'm a licensed professional counselor. And so for us, there's something called the interstate counseling compact that's being developed. So we can practice in more states than just the one that our license is, is held in. There's also a whole other topic of grief coaching and, you know, coaches versus therapists. And that's a whole different conversation. Um, there are a number of ways in which we are all looking to help individuals in more than just the state that we live in. I'm going to ask you somewhat of a crystal ball question, but do you have reason to believe that uh, legislation, if that's the appropriate term, to have you discuss interstate therapy might be coming within the next year or so? Yes. So for licensed professional counselors, it is hopefully coming early next year. For licensed clinical social workers, I think it is still, I think it's in the works, but I'm not 100% sure. That's very helpful and useful to our listeners who are right now hoping you'll be able to speak with them. They would be talking with you out of state, and that may be coming, uh, we are hoping, within a year or so. Beth, I want to encourage you to just keep going. You certainly don't need my encouragement for that, but our listeners are very encouraged with your background, your gentle voice, and your if I could use the term, your true grit to overcome anything, everything to become exactly the best person God had created you to be. And you have a very good practice. And Beth, on behalf of our listeners, I want to thank you for everything you have done, but everything you are doing to help the rest of us go forward and work our way through grief. Thank you for again for having me on the podcast. It was an honor. And I'm my goal is if I can help one person, I'm making a difference. And if I can help more than that, that's wonderful. But if I can't make you laugh during a session or help you leave feeling better, I'm not doing my job. And that's exactly what this podcast is about, Beth. If we can help even just one person that we feel our life is totally worth it, fulfilled. That's what Marty and I, who Marty and I are all about. And I sense that's what you're about as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Beth. We appreciate you. Thank, Thank you, you, Beth. This was great. Thank you. We appreciate having the opportunity to share our and our guests' life's experiences with you. The Cooper Culture advances organizations to achieve and sustain high retention rates, connected communication, and trust through personality insights and principled leadership. You can contact us at our website, thecooperculture.com, and you can contact us directly at ron at thecooperculture.com or marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at thecooperculture.com. We work with you to help assess aspects of your culture to advance the environment and people to their best performance. We do that through our staff of certified personal performance coaches, leadership trainers, keynote speakers, and disc personality behavior experts. You can book a speaking engagement directly through our website by contacting us at ron at thecooperculture.com. We look forward to sharing our life experiences with you, some of which are profound, some of which are pretty funny. Some of those life experiences are ones we'll never do that again because we've been through stuff. We truly look forward to working with you, speaking with you, helping advance you in any way that we can.